Reporting for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Yashis, and with me on Behind the Bot is Team 11329 Ice Robotics from Indiana. They came here to the West Lafayette Qualifying Tournament 2 with an incredible robot, and they finished as the winning alliance captain. Learn more about their incredible robot with an amazing level 3 hang on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. StudiCut Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. Go ad free and access our videos earlier when you support fun with a membership through YouTube Join. For $4.99 a month USD, you can now watch most of our YouTube videos ad free and gain early access to scheduled content with other options also available. Click the join button below to get started. To start things off, let's talk about how you guys planned the beginning of the season when the game first released, as this game was a little more complex than other seasons like Power Play or Center Stage. Every single year, we start off by analyzing like um, at kickoff, we see like all the different ways that we can score points and how we want to do them. And we spend all of our time brainstorming different um, ideas, designs, and then we go and rapidly prototype them um, through 3D printed models. For example, this intake that we have on our robot has gone through 12 different iterations. All right, let's move on to the chassis or drivetrain of your robot. How is it uh, developed? What type of motors are you using? Odometry, stuff like that. We are currently using uh, 435's uh, yellow jackets uh, and go build a grip force mechanum wheels. Uh, we found that these strafe a whole lot better than the old go build wheels. So it's been a great thing this year. Uh, with our low center of mass, this has really increased everything to the point of we can be traveling across the field at the fastest rate. Also on our drivetrain, we have our odometry. This year we switched to optical odometry, which is really, really nice. We get basically no error with it, but with the three-wheel odometry, the normal stuff that most people use, it does occasionally slip and occasionally gets off. So what was the main reason behind switching from three-wheel odometry to optical? And what are like the type of improvements that you've seen by switching? So like I said before, the optical odometry sensor, it has a lot more it, it has a lot less error. For example, we can drive three times around the submersible and we got was an inch of error um, just on the um, just on the uh, coordinates of the robot. On the heading of the robot, it is a it is not perfect, but after spinning around five times, we got a error of five degrees. And because it's using an IMU to track its uh, rotation and it's using just a uh, lens to track where it is on the field. Yeah, that sounds incredible. The optical odometry that I've seen this season has definitely been an improvement over your normal three wheel, two wheel odometry. Moving on, let's talk about your active intake, which was pretty stellar today. It worked most of the time from what I could see. It was pretty efficient. So let's talk more about that. This is our extendable intake this year. As soon as we saw the game, we wanted a touch it own it style intake. And we're able to achieve this by having um, a top down roller intake with a pass through. Okay, as you can see, we have a color sensor inside of our intake, and this means that we can stop the samples um, inside of our intake. Additionally, um, if the sample is the wrong color, then we can simply pass the sample through the intake. Like that. This means that even if we never have to outtake our intake, even uh, while searching through the submersible. Yeah, moving moving on next, uh, let's talk about your outtake system, which is a cloth that grabs from the active intake. How did you guys develop that? What sort of thought process went towards it, and how did how did you make it work? Uh, so one of the best ways we made it work was that we decided to put our claw at a 45 degree angle so that we can drive directly up to the sub and clip them on instantly so that we can just slam directly into the sub and don't even have to think about it. Driver's just done the second they get there. Um, we're also uh, actually don't have a way to transfer specimens, but we actually we don't need it. Uh, we have a way to grab off the back with the same arm so that we can intake the uh, samples off the ground and specimens off the wall so that we can 
so that we can keep them separate and not have to worry about intaking something. Yeah, that's all incredible. Your outtake was like amazing today and your autons every single run, you're always getting at least three, four specimens on the, on the high chamber. So, so really, really interesting to see. Uh, moving on, let's talk about your level three hang, which is one of the most unique hangs that I've seen so far this season. Let's talk more about that. All right, to start off our level three hang, we have a powered takeoff system uh, in our drive base here, which is on a Studica linear servo that actuates a gear to shove into the drivetrain and makes it so that uh, we can drive around and then put all of these together. Uh, we have these stilts that can come out with a drivetrain with a constant force spring on here. Alan, just keep it up, please. Yes. Yep, there we go. So uh, this gets our first level. We hang on to here and go down. Obviously, we move our arm out of the way. Uh, but after that, we have these hooks deploy out the top. And uh, then once we're up there, we can grab the level three bar and get that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but we're able to do this because uh, we made these stilts at the right length so that we can brace on that bottom bar and not touch the ground. So this has allowed us to get a really convenient center of mass to the point of we don't even have to think about the center of mass and when it comes to calculating how and what we needed to do for this car. Yeah, so the one thing that I'm really interested in is why did you decide to use constant four springs for the initial stage of your, of your hang as opposed to any other solution like servos or a motor? Yeah, so uh, the main reason we use constant force springs is because at our first competition, we noticed that our climb wasn't as fast as we really wanted it to be. So constant force springs helps uh, a lot. We actually are using thrifty bot uh, constant force springs, which are able to, uh, which currently have about 14 pounds pulling the robot up. And we were originally gonna go with larger ones to get about 20 pounds, but they were a little bit too large for our system. Yeah, and then finally moving on, let's talk about your software. Obviously, a robot like this has many complex mechanisms, so the software is, of course, going to be very complex as well. How did you navigate writing your code and making sure that everything worked together well? Um, all right, so on the software, so this year we have a lot of complex stuff, like for example, if we wanted to transfer, we have to bring this down into the robot, grab, and then bring it up and then out of the robot. So to do that, we I have a subsystem in my code that's purely, or a complete file that's completely just for the uh, state machine. And so basically, if we grab a piece here, um, we grab a piece, it then goes into the tray, as you can see, and then we can hit this button to transfer it. And basically it spits it out into there, grabs it, and then comes back up. And then we can also then place off the back up here. And then also, whenever we drop into the tray, our, our robot knows that it needs, the next thing we're gonna do is grab again off, out of the uh, submersible. So basically it can just come place and then come down into the store position. So it's already ready for the next thing. Also with the state machine, we can, auto, we can basically press one button and do the entire robot subsystem. So if we grab another one here, and then this time, all I'm going to do is just press one button, which is this one. It can automatically do everything itself. So this way, our drivers don't have to worry about hitting the right buttons multiple times or anything like that. We have presets for literally. Yeah, and then lastly, do you use any, how are you tracking all of these positions? Are you using any sort of PID loops, encoders? Are you using like Axon that has like their analog encoders? All right, so to, to keep the position of our Lift, we are, you're just using the encoder out of the motor. Uh, for these slides, we have the, just the encoder in the motor. And then to track the state of the robot, we have three variables in code that we figured out uh, uh, are the only three variables that we'll need. And it is, has it in the in, it, does it have it in the intake? Does it have it in the outtake mechanism? And uh, are we at the store position, which is this position right here? So basically, if we're at store position and we want to go up here, we have to first raise up the slides and then go back. But if we're if we're not at store position, then we can just go straight back. 
Uh, something that we made sure to implement this time around is we put lemon switches on every set of slides and we use the uh, detections and code on when to stop uh, the linear, anything that goes linearly that has something that may slip. We're currently using belts on these guys, so slipping is a thing that can happen. But with, uh, with the code that's able to track how much current we uh, pull through amperage or current? Amps. Amps. Amp, well, it's current and the... It's current and the uh, current unit that we use in the amps. Yeah, so we're able to track everything whenever it is, and we have the power to reset that without disabling telling up. Uh, the arm is done by the internal PID on our AGFRC servos for our arm. We find that they're a great alternative to axons and uh, occasionally axon we can't get from them. So we've uh, resorted to these. So. Also, another thing that uses current on a robot is our intake mechanism. We wanted this to basically, if it jams, we want it to automatically just spit it out and, um, and just basically be able to do anything. Basically, if or well, if it, yeah, make sure that we will. But don't, 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 don't put it in. Basically, if we, if we were to jam, you can see it's spinning this way. If we were to jam it, it automatically outtakes my hand. So it basically will spit it out if it's jammed, or if not, then it'll just keep intaking it until it grabs it. All right. And then you also have a limelight on the front of your robot. Can you explain what you're using the limelight for this season, especially since there isn't any like randomized task? So the only randomized part of the field is actually the submersible. And currently, currently where we have a, uh, a um, five specimen auto, which uh, is quite consistent, especially when we're not on the playing field. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're really hoping to implement a six specimen auto in the future. And uh, with samples, we can get all four samples that are preset in about 16 seconds uh, at our best. And so we're hoping to get a lot more samples in the future. So <clears throat> um, we wanna talk about a little bit, a, a little bit about how the limelight works. Um, I have three different pipelines set to um, threshold out the uh, the color values outside a set RGB range. Then at areas of high density, uh, where the blocks are most likely to be, it will draw a bounding box around them and then take find the center of that. Based on that point and the angled offset from the center of the block, we are able to use uh, trigonometry to calculate the uh, real world position uh, relative to our robot. <clears throat> and then, um, do you want to talk about? Yes. <laughs> uh, so then given all the 3D po positions of the blocks relative to the robot, we are able to uh, check how much time it'll take us to collect each block. And then we can basically uh, use this to see which block is the, is the best choice to pick. Uh, and we do this with a system of parametric equations. Um, we can do this both for polar coordinates and both for uh, Cartesian coordinates, which is very helpful. Um. All right, and then the last thing before I go, their intake CAD is actually public, publicly available online. So please make sure to check the description if you want to see how their intake works or even use it on your own robot. So anyways, thanks for joining me on Behind the Bot. And I'll see you viewers next time. Student Cup Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. Go ad free and access our videos earlier when you support fun with a membership through YouTube Join. For $4.99 a month USD, you can now watch most of our YouTube videos ad free and gain early access to scheduled content with other options also available. Click the join button below to get started.